Last time we talked about life on planets very far from their stars, like Pluto. This time we'll be looking at life very close to stars instead. Now, that can mean two different types of planets, ones which are very hot because they're very near a star, like Mercury, or ones that aren't hot because their sun is very dim. We'll look at the first case, hot or Thonian planets, another time. In the latter case, the worlds would have to be so close to their sun that they could become tidally locked to it. So one side always got sunlight, and the other side never did. The biggest factor in tidal locking is how close the object is to the thing it is orbiting, and planets around red dwarfs have to be very close to be warm enough to be classically habitable. These worlds, sometimes called twilight worlds or eyeball earths, will be our focus for today. Incidentally, if you're not too familiar with tidal locking, you may wish to pause this video and click the link to the short tidal locking companion video I did for this. It explains what tidal locking is, how and why it happens, and why we think planets near red dwarf stars would tend to be tidally locked. Also, incidentally, if you're newer to my videos and have a hard time understanding me, you should turn on the closed captions for this video, which ought to help. I've got a bit of a speech impediment, as I'm sure you've noticed. So you have a tidally locked planet. This tends to get envisioned as a desert on the sun side and dark ice on the night side, with a thin habitable area around the rim lit by twilight, hence the name Twilight Worlds, and the whole light side lit by a tiny glowing red star. But how accurate is this notion? Like a lot of things seen in science fiction, accuracy is a bit hit and miss. First, we don't know that all, or even most, worlds that are near red dwarves would be tidally locked. Red dwarves are the supermajority of stars in the universe, and cover a pretty broad range, from ones more than half as massive as our own sun, to ones less than a tenth of its mass. That's a far wider proportional variation in mass than most of the stellar types, and on the more massive end, we wouldn't expect habitable worlds to be tidally locked. Moreover, atmospheres and oceans, as well as moons, can impede tidal locking processes. Again, we discussed that in the companion video. So the bigger red dwarves can have habitable worlds with orbits that take two or three months, while the smallest, it can be two or three days. For these smaller ones, tidal locking is a lot more plausible, since not only is distance the biggest factor in tidal locking, but also because it's hard to have a big moon on a planet so close to a star that might destabilize its orbit. The other big misconception, or partial misconception, is the appearance of that star to those living on the planet. First, while these stars are smaller, they are way, way closer, so they look much bigger in the sky than our own sun does. They would seem to be giant blobs in the sky. Second, while they would look red from the twilight band, for the same reason our sun looks red at twilight, red dwarves aren't really red. Our color classification system for stars was a very early and loose system that's just stuck around. All stars look white. Our own yellow sun, which is actually green, or emits its peak wavelength in green light anyway, is fundamentally white. It is too bright in too many frequencies to have a color. Red dwarves have their own peak frequency in the red range of the spectrum, but so do incandescent light bulbs. On any tightly locked world, red dwarf or white supergiant, the sun will look red from the twilight band because of all the air it passes through acting like a prism in what's called valley scattering. Everywhere else you would see it on a world with an earth-like atmosphere, and most of the types you might expect, the sky will look blue and the sun will be a big, white, glowing orb. The exception would be a habitable world around a red giant, because those are simply so big and dim the sun would just blanket the sky in red light rather than being a dense, bright object. For most stars, though, the sun and the sky on most of the planet will look more or less like our own does, and its atmosphere's makeup will be the big effect on color, and it will vary a lot just like our own does with the time of day and weather. Mars has at times a bluish-gray sky, a red one, and a butterscotch one. Now, what do we mean by this twilight band? How wide is it? Is it the only place life can be? Is one side really desert and the other a massive sheet of ice miles deep? And the answer in all those cases is a mix of maybe and depends. We imagine them as deserts on the sun side because if the light is always shining down on one spot, growing a bit weaker as you get away from latitude and longitude zero, you ought to have a constant wind emanating out, pushing the moisture away and never carrying it back, 
until it deposited on the dark side an ever thickening sheet till at last there was no water anywhere except on a very thin band at the rim. However, tightly locked objects do sort of squirm around. We say our own moon only shows us one face all the time, so we see half of it, but that's not quite true. Libration, an effect of the eccentricity of orbits and of things not being point-like objects, makes slightly more than half of a tightly locked object visible to the object it's locked to. We can see about 59% of the moon's surface over the course of a month, not 50%. For a tightly locked planet with similar libration, this would mean the sun would actually dip over and under the horizon in some places of the twilight band. And again, most habitable zone planets around red dwarfs have planetary years lasting only a few days to a few months, with the ones most likely to be tightly locked on the shorter end of that. So you'd have spots, for the smaller dwarves, where the sun dipped over and under the horizon every few days, or on a weekly cycle. For them it's a yearly cycle since they have a very short year and their day is exactly as long as their year, but we'll try to keep this in comfortable Earth units when we can, hopefully without causing too much confusion. And that short year has another effect, because while our own seasons have to do with our axial tilt, the Earth does get more or less light when it's closer or farther from the Sun. Amusingly, at least for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, the Earth is actually closest to the Sun not long after the winter solstice in January, and furthest in July. That's pure coincidence, but it does mean the Earth gets about 7% more light in January than in July, and the Earth has a very low orbital eccentricity. Mercury, the one closest to the Sun, has the most eccentricity of any planet, and it gets more than twice as much sunlight when closest to the sun than it does when furthest away. So a tidally locked world with a decent eccentricity might experience seasons on, say, a two-week orbit, where the eternal day is cooled or warmed rather noticeably. That effect could easily result in weather moving moisture around in peculiar ways. Next, there's the dark side. It's worth remembering that Antarctica is hardly lifeless even in the places where it's dark six months out of the year, and we found life buried under the ice down there, too. Tidally locked plants don't start tidally locked, and as we discussed with Pluto, where we do suspect there are oceans under the ice, or Jupiter's moon Europa, you can have liquid water where you wouldn't expect it. There's hundreds of lakes buried under the ice in Antarctica. So we don't want to write off even the dark sides of these worlds as utterly barren and sterile. You've got this massive miles-deep block of ice there, constantly melting on the sides and having snow come from the sun side adding back to it. But that's not the only cause of melting. Ice has weight, and that means pressure, and it also means sideways motion. If you're familiar with Game of Thrones, where they have this giant wall made of ice and gravel, you might have heard people mention that it ought to be way wider at the bottom, and that that bottom should expand as it gets taller and melt more near the bottom. Obviously that is supposed to be a somewhat magic wall and it's a fantasy novel, but when the laws of physics apply, a giant ice cube is going to squish down, get wider at the bottom, and melt in the lower layer so the water isn't going to stay totally trapped there. And depending on how much water the world has, you get a thin, world-spanning ocean at the rim with ice bolts constantly snapping off into it. Also, oceans transport heat around too, so they could expand this habitable band quite a bit. Taken as a whole, these twilight worlds with their thin habitable bands might be a lot wider than we used to think. So wide that twilight band might not be properly descriptive for some, and the term eyeball earth might be more apt. So, could we colonize such a world? Yeah, sure. On the grand list of screwed up plants with weird conditions, these sorts are a heck of a lot easier to terraform than most will discuss, uh, for a given value of the word terraform and probably easier than some places like Mars or Venus. Adapting plants to perpetual daylight is probably feasible, and most plants only use a small fraction of the light that hits them at noon anyway, so eternal twilight isn't a big deal. It wouldn't seem very dark to us, either. Your eyes are logarithmic in their sensitivity, which is why your light bulbs in your home seem perfectly bright at nighttime, but during the day with the windows open, even though only a small fraction of sunlight gets in the windows, you'd barely notice the lights were on. Most house lights illuminate a room at about one thousandth the brightness of the noontime sun, around as bright as the sun on Pluto, actually. So a twilight area of tidally locked world isn't going to seem dim to you, anyway. It will be red from all the air, and the water will be a lot darker, 
but by and large it will be fairly unexceptional from our point of view. Plus, as we mentioned in the video on Pluto, you can always use orbital mirrors, thin lightweight ones, to light dark sides up and shade the sunny side. You could even substitute a normal Earth 24-hour day-night cycle if you were ambitious. After all, a thin mirror can be shiny on one side and opaque on the other side, and you can make the thing tilt parallel or perpendicular to a star and twist their direction as needed. All things being equal, a tightly locked world is probably the easiest kind to terraform closest to Earth's own conditions. Now, how about life evolving there in the first place? Well, there are some challenges there. First off, life, at least any life based off normal chemistry, even if it isn't our style of chemistry, doesn't handle ultraviolet or x-ray radiation well, and red dwarfs give that off, especially when they're younger. You need a magnetosphere to protect that life. Very thick atmospheres or life living under water helps, but for classic land life you really do need that magnetic solar shield. We get ours on Earth from a giant metal molten core spinning around. Tightly locked worlds do rotate. Their day and their year are the same, but they do spin. Ganymede, Jupiter's largest moon and the largest moon in the solar system, actually bigger than the planet Mercury, is tightly locked to Jupiter and does have a powerful magnetosphere. As I recall, it's the only moon with a strong one, and it's still so weak that Jupiter's own field dominates it at that distance. Without that magnetosphere, a planet is not just going to have the life on it irradiated, but could get its whole atmosphere stripped off by the charged particles its sun deluges it with. Realistically, they don't just need a magnetic field nearly as strong as ours. They need one decently stronger, because red dwarves are fairly unstable as stars go, and can really oscillate their radiation a lot. On the terraforming end, that's not a barrier that can't be overcome. You can simulate a magnetosphere by having big solar-powered magnets around the planet orbiting just like you do the orbital meals. On the natural life end, though, that is a worry. Air protects from ionizing radiation, and our twilight bands will have a lot of air protecting them. That's why the twilights here on Earth are red. Light has to pass through far more air at twilight than at noon. And again, the world could have a natural magnetosphere of great strength, but while that's not entirely dependent on the rotational speed of a planet, and tightly locked worlds do still rotate once a year, which for them might only be a few days or weeks, it doesn't help matters having less rotation. Another consideration is collisions. Red dwarfs aren't all that much less massive than our own sun, even if they are way dimmer, so they could have fairly massive collections of planets like we do. Those planets might be more densely packed, but they also have a lot more comets, and since they are dimmer, these won't evaporate nearly as quickly. There's good odds we owe our own oceans and atmosphere in large part to getting whacked with tons of comets. This is probably a bigger threat to life-bearing worlds around a red dwarf since there could be a lot more comets hitting the thing and more gravitational perturbations by other planets knocking things into collision orbits, and collisions are going to be more common anyway since things are packed together tighter. Circumstance depending, that could be a benefit or hindrance to life evolving there. We don't know for sure how most of these factors add up as pros or cons since we don't exactly have a plethora of life-bearing worlds to examine or accurate models of how durable life is. But that aspect alone might make red dwarfs barren and sterile. Or it might not. In these videos, unlike the Fermi Paradox videos, we take a more optimistic approach to where life might show up. The other good news is we probably won't have to wait terribly long to learn about uh, such planets. In a hunt for exoplanets, worlds close enough to be tidally locked are among the easiest kind to detect. In that optimistic regard, Tidally locked worlds around red dwarf stars look like pretty good candidates not just for simple life, as we discussed with Pluto, but for complex life too. And as science has rolled on, we found a lot more positives, and negatives, for these kind of worlds hosting life. More than we can cover here today, and we just do not know yet. But fundamentally, while most of the planet isn't very habitable for large land animals like us, probably about 5-20% to would be. And even if that area was mostly ocean like Earth is, that's still a large continent worth of land. Probably enough to support a lot of biodiversity, and the numbers needed to be putting together a technological civilization from hunter-gatherer levels. So, Twilight Wars get the stamp of plausible for possible homeworlds of intelligent life. That's it for today. If you've enjoyed the video, hit the like button and try some of the other videos. 
and don't forget to hit the subscribe button to be alerted when new videos come out. Thanks for watching and have a great day.